Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel. That's a good-looking boy right there, amen, a good-looking young man. Uh, thank you so much uh, for helping us out uh, by reading the Lord's Prayer today and praying the Lord's Prayer for us, Gabriel. Would you please pray with me and for me? Most gracious loving Lord, I ask now for your help. And Lord, I pray these words I speak today that, more importantly, Lord, they might line up with what you desire us to know, to know about loving you and loving others. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but the NFL draft was this week, and uh, it reminded me of a story uh, about the Washington Redskins. And this story uh, took place in the 80s when the Redskins were relevant and when the Redskins were good. Uh, and, uh, they were, um, uh, and what was going on is they were getting ready to have a game, and Joe Gibbs, their coach, was going to give them a pep talk, and so they're all in the locker room. And uh, also in the locker room was uh, the quarterback, Joe Theismann. Many people know him. And also John Riggins, uh, the famous running back. So, um, so anyway, so Joe Gibbs is getting ready to give his pep talk. And he looked at Joe Theismann. And he says, Joe, when I am done with my pep talk, I want you to lead the team in praying the Lord's Prayer. And Joe kind of reluctantly shook his head, okay. And uh, if you know anything about Joe Theismann, he's never at a loss for words. But he was at a loss for words here. But he said, okay. And, and so Coach Gibbs started to give his pep talk. And Theismann's over there. And he looks like he's sweating. In the back of the room is John Riggins, and John Riggins is actually beside the chaplain from the Washington Redskins. And John Riggins looks at the chaplain and says, hey, I bet you $20 Theismann doesn't know the Lord's Prayer. And the chaplain's like, I don't know if I should be betting on whether somebody knows the Lord's Prayer or not. And, uh, and so uh, he started thinking to himself, you know, he did go to Notre Dame, and so he's a good Catholic boy. He probably knows the Lord's Prayer. So he says, I'll take that bet. He said to Riggins, I'll take the bet. So Theismann's sweating. Joe Gibbs is, finishes his prayer, and then he nods over to Theismann, and Theismann starts to pray. Now I'll lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray to the Lord my soul to take. Regans gets up. He goes to his lockers, gets $20 out of his wallet, and he gives it to the chaplain and says, I had no idea he would have known the Lord's Prayer. All right, that's as good as it gets today. So amen. Uh, anyway, um, today we're going to continue to talk about the Lord's Prayer. And uh, as I said earlier, we talked last week about the first uh, uh, part of this, the first phrase of the Lord's Prayer, adoration, about glorifying God and lifting God up. And today we're going to continue by talking about the second uh, component of the Lord's Prayer. And again, Jesus was asked by his disciples how to pray. They had seen Jesus pray a million times. And when Jesus prayed, things happened. And the disciples just said, you know what, we want to be able to pray like him. And so one day... They got up the nerve and they asked Jesus how to pray. And he prays what we today call the Lord's Prayer, this prayer that Christians have been praying for over 2,000, for almost 2,000 years. Last week, uh, we talked about adoration. And this week, we're going to look at the second part, which says this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if I had to group this together as to what it's going to be talking about today, the first component was adoration. This one is going to be submission. Or as Carrie just sang a few moments ago, surrender. I surrender all. Submission. Uh, submission means to accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. And so when we get to this part of the Lord's Prayer, when we talk about submission, what we're talking about is submitting to God. And so I'm going to try to answer three questions today. What does this mean? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then how do we do this inwardly? What does that mean inwardly? And then thirdly, what does this mean outwardly? First, what does this mean? I don't know if you've ever picked up on this, but I don't believe our world is as it's supposed to be. You look around and there's all kinds of things going on. There's this virus going around our world today that's killing people. That's not the way things are supposed to be. And when we pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, what we're praying for is that things would come to, that things would be the way they're supposed to be. 
that they would be on earth as they are in heaven. And when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're praying for is that humanity would be redeemed to what it was originally intended to be. Dallas Willard writes, the kingdom of God is wherever God's will is actually done, where God is king, where God is reigning. There are spots in our world where heaven has come to earth, but it seems to us that there are, they are few and far between. When we pray thy kingdom come, we are praying for God's will to come on earth uh, and that everything to become as it was meant to be, as it was supposed to be. No more hunger. No more viruses. No quarantine. No shortage of toilet paper, amen? No worry about war. No need for military because there would be no war. Democrats and Republicans would get along. Families would be united. Bishop N.T. Wright says this, Heaven and earth are two interlocking arenas of God's good world. Heaven is God's space where God writs, runs, and God's future purposes are waiting in the wings. Earth is our world, our space. Think of the vision at the end of the book of Revelation. It's about humans being snatched up from earth to heaven, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And let me just, I want to make sure I said that correctly. It isn't about humans being snatched up from earth to heaven. The holy city, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth. God's space and ours are finally married, integrated at last. This is what we pray for when we pray, thy kingdom come. We're praying for God's kingdom up there to be fully manifested down here. When we pray thy kingdom come, we are praying for God's kingdom and our world to be uh, merged together as one. What is interesting is that this is a nice thing to pray, but then how do we do it? How do we do it? Thy will be done. Think about that phrase. Thy will be done. For some of us, this part of the prayer could be our worst nightmare. Because this means that we do what God desires us to do before we do what we desire to do. And one of the things that's really jumped out to me as I've studied the Lord's Prayer is the order of which it is in. We started last week with adoration, where we're to glorify God and we're to thank God for who God is, that we're to see God as our heavenly parent, as our Father, and that we are to uh, know that He is as close as the air that we breathe, and we are to hollow God's name. But our step today is to submit, is to ask for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done. Next week, we're going to look at daily bread this is where we have supplication. This is where we have petition. This is where we ask for what we desire. But notice that God's will be done comes before give me. God's will comes before give me. I don't know about you, but often I want it to be about me first. Amen? I'd rather have give me than worry about God's will. But that is not the way Jesus sets up this prayer. God's will be done comes before we are to ask for our daily bread. And perhaps one reason God's kingdom is not expanding or that it's not meshing with our world is because many of us are praying, give me before we pray thy will. And if we want God's kingdom to come in ourselves and in our community and our world, we need to follow Jesus' pattern of prayer and pray, Thy will before give me. Say amen if you can. Amen. The first weekend of 2020, uh, at the end of the sermon, we, we introduced you to Wesley's covenant prayer. Woodlake's prayed this prayer for many years. And if there's ever been a prayer that, that kind of meshes with uh, God's will before my will, it's this prayer. Look at, look at what it says. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. 
And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And this covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. That prayer is all about thy will before give me. It's all about that. And if you struggle with putting God before yourself, pray this prayer. Get the order right of the Lord's Prayer. Pray Wesley's Covenant Prayer. And I believe it will fundamentally change your relationship with God. Now hear this. Nothing is wrong about going to God with our request. Nothing at all. Turn a person beside you and say nothing at all. God invites us to do this. And next week, we'll be focusing on our petitions to God. So please hear that. But the order really matters. If you pray thy will before give me, you will have both a satisfied God's heart and a satisfied your heart. If you say thy will before give me, if you do it the other way around where you say give me before thy will, you will have neither God's heart nor your heart satisfied. And that's what makes the gospel upside down. It just doesn't make sense. It almost defies logic. That's why we shouldn't be first, why we should seek to be last. That's why we are called to serve before we are to be served. But the problem is, the world teaches teaches us almost all the time that it's all about us, amen? One of the things I've been doing with this quarantine is I've been watching a little bit of Seinfeld. Seinfeld's one of my favorite TV shows. And the episode was on the other day where uh, George, one of the characters, uh, was at a, bir- a child's birthday party. And a fire breaks out, right? And George is the first one that leaves the party. And he pushes uh, the grandmother who's on a walker down. And he pushes all the kids out of the way so he can be the first one to escape. Because it was all about him, right? It was all about him. And part of what makes that so funny is because it emphasizes a larger truth, right? Often we are self-centered and self-focused. And that continues with our relationship with God. I believe you'll never fully be able to fully relate to God as long as you have these two components of prayer mixed up. The reason for this is that when we pray, thy will be done, we are treating God as a subject and not as an object. We are treating God as God and not as a computer program. Think about your relationships, your most precious relationships, your friends, your your boyfriend, girlfriend, your spouse, or others that are important to you. Are they important to you because they are serviceable to you, because of what they provide for you? Or is it simply because you love them? Do you love them because of who they are? Or do you love them because of the things they do for you? And if you love them for their servableness, because of the things they do for you, then I really don't think that's love. The correct answer to that question is, I love you because of who you are. In the relationship, you know this. It's built on love not on what the person can or does do for you. This perspective changes everything. If the relationship is about being serviceable and then the service stops, the relationship's broken. There's nothing there. I have a friend, and um, he had a very um, good job, uh, made a lot of money, and um, was living in Texas, and was part of a country club, had a big house, and um, they were just living the good life. Everybody was happy. And then a bizarre accident happened to my friend. He was playing pickup basketball and broke his leg and broke it up very high, and he had to get one of those casts that went all the way up your leg and a little bit beyond. And what what happened is that this was the beginning of the end of his marriage. Um, his wife did not want to take care of him. See, in this relationship, part of the reason I believe she loved him is because of what he was able to give her. 
And as soon as he was unserviceable, and she had to start providing service, it changed the dynamics of that relationship. And that relationship quickly fell apart. In many ways, he became a burden to her. And it wasn't love. Now, I'm sure there's more to the story than, than that. But I think that's an example of, of, an exa- of what can happen when we make a relationship all about what the goods that are provided and not about the actual relationship. Because what can happen is that this can sometimes happen in our relationship with God. We go to God because we want goods and services, not because we want relationship with God. I want God in my life because if I do this and I do that, God will bless me and he will give me these things. And I want those things. I'm going to pray because if I do, I might be able to get this and I might be able to get that. The relationship becomes not about connecting and being with God. It comes about receiving and getting. Here's a question for you to think about today. What is your motive for seeking God? Is it seeking goods and services? Or is it seeking God because God first loved us and because he sent his son Jesus to be our savior and because of his unconditional love and acceptance? What is the reason you're praying? And the why and the way Jesus ordered this prayer helps us. It reminds us to do this. I love Psalm 37, 4. This is what it says. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What I love about this passage and what it says to me is that when you seek God first, when you make God, the, when you make God, um, a, when you delight yourself in God, your desires start to line up with what God wants. What God wants to give you becomes what you really want. And so when you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. And the reason is because they mesh up, because they match. They're the same. But if we don't delight ourselves in the Lord, we seek God for goods and for services. Often we seek God saying, this is what I want, and if I get this, then I will be happy. Then I will go to church, then I will pray, then I will serve, then I will give. And sometimes what happens, we get what we actually want, and we find out it's not enough. We actually want more. It satisfies us for like a millisecond, right? And then we go on to something else, and we work really hard, and we get that, and then we're happy for a a brief moment, and then we keep wanting more. And we're not happy. What would happen if you began to live this out? God's will before give me. What would happen if we began to pray, thy will be done, uh, give, before we pray, give me my daily bread? What would happen in my heart? I'm a pastor, as you know, and I'm supposed to be spiritually mature, but sometimes this is hard for me. It's hard for me to say thy will before give me because I want to be given to. But what would our world look like? What would our community look like? What would our families look like if we began to do this? Our communities would be transformed. Our homes would be transformed. Our church would be transformed. One of the other things I've been doing is I've been watching old, I love sports, and so I've been watching uh, the NBA network, Major League, and the NFL networks, watching all these old games. And one of the things they showed the other week uh, was a 2008 NBA All-Star game that took place in New Orleans. And this uh, game took place the year after the horrible hurricane uh, where there was so much destruction. And one of the things it reminded me of is that during the All-Star game, the NBA players went out to the, to the city and they did work. They did, uh, they did work trying to help the city recover. And there was this interview with one of the residents that lived in New Orleans. And, and what he said is, is one of the crazy things that would happen is, is that people, these tour buses would come to New Orleans and they would come to see the destruction that the hurricane had made. They'd get out, they'd walk around. And then they get back in the bus and they leave. They didn't offer any help. They didn't offer any money. 
They just came, saw the destruction, and left. That is not what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is where God, where what God wants to happen actually happens. May we bring up there, down here. I have a few next steps I want to work through today. And here's the first one. Pray the Lord's Prayer daily. And again, when we do these next steps, uh, if you want to pick one is, is what we hope you'll do. And if you want to do more than that, that's fine. But our main objective is for you to pick one of these. And so the first one is what we had last week, pray the Lord's Prayer. And again, I want you to work through this and, and, and talk about the components. So just a quick example. Uh, our pray to prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Lord, I thank you for loving me so much. I thank you that you, that you love us so much that we can call you Father, that we can call you Dad. Uh, Lord, um, help me to know that you are as close as the air that we breathe. You're not in a galaxy far, far away. And lastly, Lord, help me to honor and hallow your name. And then you continue on with the prayer. Uh, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that your kingdom would come. I pray that the way things are in heaven would be the way they are here on earth. And I pray, Lord, that I would do that, that I would surrender, that I would submit myself to you and ask for your will be done before I ask, give me. Help me to do that. Help me to do that in everything I do. And may I be somebody that expands your kingdom. And so our hope is, as we pray through the Lord's Prayer, it won't be just a, a one time through the prayer, but you'll pray each component, and you'll talk about what we were talking about these six weeks of this prayer. And so pray the Lord's Prayer daily. Secondly, is I want you just to remember this phrase, God's will before give me. We've included the Wesley Covenant Prayer on our website. If it's a prayer we prayed early. If you Google Wesley's Covenant Prayer, you'll be able to get it as well. But it's also on our website. Maybe you want to add this to your prayer ritual as well. I believe you'll be blessed if you do. And it will help, you, help all of us get the focus off of ourselves and on to you first. God's will before give me. And then the last next step is how we live this out. And that's to be a kingdom bringer a kingdom bringer. This means that you pray to bring up there down here, that you go out and you do, that you be love. When you give food to the food pantries that are in desperate need of food, you are bringing up there down here. When you know that you have a lonely neighbor who, who has no family with them and they're not going out of the house because they're scared and you give them a phone call, you take them a meal and leave on their doorstep, that's bringing God's kingdom up there down here. That's being a kingdom bringer. And God wants us to be kingdom bringers. Paul, go ahead and put Megan's picture up. This is a picture of Megan. She's a member of our church and uh, uh, along with her family, which includes her twin sister, Julie. And uh, Megan's just an incredible lady and uh, has tremendous faith and is a real blessing to so many people that knows her. Megan suffers from chronic pain uh, as a uh, result of Aylens Danlus, and I'm sure I butchered that name there, Megan, uh, but that's what I'm, Ehlers Danlus, I believe that's what I call it. Uh, I probably should call it EDS, maybe uh, that's what we should call it. But what this means is, is that she has a lot of pain and that she has less than 15 to 20 hours a week where she can be upright. Think about that. A week, not a day, a week, 15 hours 15 to 20 hours a week where she can be upright. And so she's an active part of our church. And uh, this past week was her and her sister's birthday. And uh, she's an active part of our, our church. And she's in a uh, small group, uh, the group that is called We Love You Too. We Love You Too. And uh, their birthday was on Thursday. And a member of their group, Tracy, uh, had this idea. And this is a little bit of her words. Uh, and she says, uh, Tuesday morning around 9, Jessica, Jackie, and I were texting about Megan's birthday and ideas we were having to celebrate it. Jessica's idea was, was the parade, and I had been thinking the same thing. I offered to contact everyone I could think of from the We Love You Too group. We had a Zoom meeting that night with ladies from, from the group and Connect, so I didn't have a chance to text Tuesday night. Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, I finally got the chance to send out the message. So we sent out the message. And many members of the group showed up, and Paul's got a picture of this, showed up uh, to do a parade for her birthday. You can see the balloons. You can see the people from the group. 
Uh, and, uh, and then there were also other people. Uh, this is what Tracy writes. There were also two women in an SUV behind our line who, thought I was, who I thought were part of our group. I ran up to the car all excited to tell them what to do, and I realized they were not with our group. They were just excited to see me and ran up to their vehicle. I apologized for possibly blocking the road and asked what they were doing. I explained and asked if they wanted to join us, and they said yes. And so these two people who had no idea who Megan was, they'd love to, and they did. And they were just as excited to wish Megan a happy birthday as we were. God is good. Megan's response after the parade was this. Not enough thank yous in the world for how thankful I am for you all and everyone. You make my heart happy, and I love this. You make my heart happy, and turned, I can't take this anymore. And she's referring to the pain. I can't take this anymore, birthday, into the most memorable birthday ever. God shines through you all, and I am blessed to have you in my life. Thank you. That's bringing God's kingdom up there down here. We are called to be kingdom bringers. May we go out after the service today and may we find out how we can be kingdom bringers in our communities. Who are the people that we need to bless? Who are the people that we need to help? Who are the people that we need to share and show that they are loved by the Most High God? May we be kingdom bringers. May we make the love of Jesus Christ accessible to all. That's what this means. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Lord, you are indeed an awesome God, and we thank you so much for this prayer. Lord, help us to surrender ourselves to you. May we pray that your kingdom would be on earth as it is in heaven. May we realize, Lord, that for us to do that, we have to pray your will, God's will, thy will, be forgive me. And may we be kingdom bringers. May we go, even in this quarantine world we live in today, may we go, and may we bring your kingdom up there down here. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.